This is lesson two in our Calculus 2 series, the natural logarithmic function. In pre-calculus class, we learn about exponential functions. Those are functions of the form y equals a to the x, where a is positive and not equal to one. For example, y equals two to the x, y equals five to the x, y equals one third to the x. We also learn about their corresponding inverse functions, the logarithmic functions. So y equals a to the x has inverse function y equals log base a of x because remember, this expression here means a to the y equals x. And that's the inverse of y equals a to the x because it's switching the roles of x and y. So for example, the inverse of these exponential functions are here. You also may have seen y equals e to the x for our special number e, which is approximately 2.718, and its inverse y equals ln x, or the natural log of x, which is log base e of x. But in pre-calculus, we can only give an intuitive idea about what it means to define a to the x when x is an irrational number. So all that you've seen before about exponential and log functions really wasn't presented in a formal way. Here, we begin a formal definition and presentation of exponential and log functions. And we start in this lesson with the natural logarithmic function. In the next two lessons, we get to the natural exponential function and general exponential and log functions. So our natural logarithmic function ln x is going to be defined as the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. And this is defined for x positive. So for x greater than 1, we can interpret this integral as the area under the curve y equals 1 over t between the t values of 1 and x. So here's 1, here's x, since x is greater than 1, we know it's on the right side of 1, and we're talking about this area here. That's what ln x gives us with this definition for x greater than 1. For x equal to 1, we're getting the integral from 1 to 1, and we know that when we have a definite integral with the bounds being equal, that integral is equal to 0. So that says ln of 1 is equal to 0. And for x between 0 and 1, we want to reverse the order of the bounds. So we introduce a negative sign, and this is negative integral from x to 1, 1 over t dt. So that's negative of the area under y equals 1 over t over the interval from x to 1. So we're talking about then negative of this area for all the x values between 0 and 1. We also have that the limit as x goes to infinity of ln x is infinity, and the limit as x goes to zero from the right of ln x is negative infinity. Now we can get an understanding of these limits by taking a look at the graphs here in the definition, but I'm not gonna go through the formal proof. As x goes to zero from the right, we're talking about the area here, and what we're saying is that as x goes towards zero, this area is infinite. Similarly, as x goes towards infinity, this area is infinite. Also note that by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we can find the derivative of ln x very simply. The derivative of the integral here from 1 to x of 1 over t dt is going to be 1 over x. So the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. Now, since ln x is only defined for x positive, we know that 1 over x is also always going to be positive. This says that f of x is an increasing function. We can take a second derivative. f double prime is going to be the derivative of 1 over x. That's negative 1 over x squared. And we see that this is always negative. That tells us f is concave down. So with all of this information that we have here, we can sketch the graph of ln x. It goes through 1, 0. The limit as x goes to 0 from the right is negative infinity, the limit as x goes to infinity is positive infinity, it's increasing and concave down. Now with this definition of ln x, we also have the usual laws of logarithms. That says for x and y positive and r rational, we have ln xy is equal to ln x plus ln y, ln of x over y is equal to ln x minus ln y, 
and ln of x to the r power is equal to r ln x. I'm not proving these here, but you can find that in most textbooks. Also with this definition of ln x, we define e to be the number such that ln e is equal to 1. And we'll talk more about e and the exponential function in the next lesson. Notice that ln x is strictly increasing, which says that it's a one-to-one -one function. So when we define e to be the number such that ln e is equal to one, this is well defined. There is only one value x for which ln x is equal to one. And so here is e. Now let's take a look at differentiation with ln x. We know the derivative of ln x is 1 over x, so when we have a composition ln of g of x, we use the chain rule and get 1 over g of x times g prime of x. So our derivative here is g prime of x over g of x. For example, if we have y equals ln of x squared plus 10, the inside function g of x is x squared plus 10 here. So we're going to put g prime of x in the numerator, that's 2x, and g of x in the denominator, that's x squared plus 10. So here, y prime is 2x over x squared plus 10. In this example, we have y equals x times ln x, and so we're going to need to use the product rule here. So remember, the product rule says derivative of the first times the second plus first times derivative of the second. Derivative of x is 1. Derivative of ln x is 1 over x. This simplifies here to a 1, and so we're left with ln x plus 1. Here we're asked to find dy dx for ln of xy equal to y sine x. The first thing I want to do here is use laws of logarithms to separate the ln xy. As it's written here, it looks like it's going to be implicit differentiation with a product inside a chain. So to simplify that, let's write this as ln x plus ln y on the left-hand side. Now, we notice that it's still going to be implicit differentiation, but at least we don't have product inside a chain. So remember that implicit differentiation has us taking the derivative with respect to x of both sides of the equation. On the left side, we get 1 over x plus 1 over y times dy dx. On the right side, we need to use the product rule. So we have the derivative of the first times the second plus first times derivative of the second. So derivative of y is dy dx multiplied by sine x plus y times the derivative of sine x. So that's cosine x here. So now we want to solve for dy dx. So we bring all our dy dx terms to one side and everything else to the other side. We factor out by dy dx, and then divide by the remaining factor. So now we're here, but notice that we have fractions within our fraction. So this isn't a simplified answer. How can we simplify this answer? Well, we need to multiply by x over x in order to get rid of this fraction. We also need to multiply by y over y in order to get rid of this fraction. So we're going to multiply by xy over xy, and this is our simplified solution. This is dy dx. Now we're going to talk about integrating with ln x, but first let's take a look at ln of absolute value of x. What is this function? This function can be written piecewise as ln x for x values that are strictly positive, and ln of negative x for x values that are strictly negative. Remember that we can only plug positive numbers into the natural log function, so this function ln of absolute x is not defined when x is equal to zero. Now let's take a look at the derivative here, the derivative of ln of absolute x. We're looking for the derivative of each of these functions. Well, we know the derivative of ln x is one over x, and here we're gonna use the chain rule. G of x is equal to negative x, so our derivative is going to be g prime over g, so that's going to be negative 1 over negative x. That also simplifies to 1 over x. So for x values positive or x values negative, the derivative here is the same 1 over x. So the derivative of ln of absolute x is 1 over x. 
That says that our integral of 1 over x is ln of absolute x plus c. If we hadn't considered using ln of the absolute value of x, we would be restricting our domain here to x values that were positive. But because we're using the absolute value of x, we can include all of the negative x values, and so the only x value that is excluded here is x equals 0. Now let's take a look at this example. We have the antiderivative of 2x squared plus 3 over x minus 5. And the first thing I notice here with this 3 over x is that this is 3 times 1 over x. So I want to recognize that so I can use this new integration rule that we have. So our integral here is going to be 2x to the third over 3. This factor of 3 just carries down to the antiderivative, and the antiderivative of 1 over x is ln absolute x. Antiderivative of negative 5 is negative 5x and we add on our integration constant, so we're here. Now let's take a look at what we have here, 2x plus 7 over x squared plus 7x minus 1. Now, when we were taking the derivative of a composition using ln x, we had ln of g of x, and we recognized that its derivative was going to be g prime over g. So one of the first things that you should look for when you're integrating a quotient is to see if the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. Because if it is, it's going to be a u substitution where u is the function in the denominator. Here we recognize that the derivative of x squared plus 7x minus 1 is 2x plus 7, and that's exactly what we have in the numerator. So we're going to let u equal x squared plus 7x minus 1, and then du is going to be 2x plus 7 dx. And so our integral here can be written as du over u or 1 over u du. And we just learned that the antiderivative of 1 over u du is ln absolute u. And so this is ln absolute u plus a constant. And writing it in terms of x is ln of absolute x squared plus 7x minus 1 plus a constant. So again, one of the first things you should check when you're integrating a quotient is, is the numerator the derivative of the denominator? Or even a multiple of the derivative of the denominator? Because we could adjust by a constant factor. So even if this had said 4x plus 14, we could have worked with that. Let's take a look at logarithmic differentiation. For an example like this, y equals x to the third plus 1 all to the fourth times sine squared x over cube root of x. When we look at this and we want to find y prime, we already have the tools to do this. It's just going to be a mess because we're going to have two chain rules inside a product, inside a quotient. And so it might be useful to apply the natural log function to both sides of this equation because we know that laws of logs can separate this and simplify it quite a bit. So we take the ln of both sides, and so we have ln y is equal to ln of this quantity here. Now we want to expand using the laws of logarithms. So please pause the video, take a minute, and expand this using the laws of logarithms. Dealing first with the quotient on the right-hand side gives us ln of x to the third plus 1 to the fourth sine x squared minus ln of x to the one-third. Now we've got a product here, so we can separate using addition. ln of x to the third plus 1 to the fourth plus ln of sine of x squared. And now we have powers in each of these terms that can come down. So our fourth power comes in front here. Our second power comes in front here, and our one-third power comes in front here. So remember, when we have sine squared x, really that is sine x quantity squared. So I made that distinction here just to make it easier as I'm using the laws of logs. And so now we're here. And this is much simpler than the equation we started out with. So now we want to take the derivative. But be careful, on the left-hand side, we have ln of y. So we need to use the chain rule. It's really implicit differentiation when we're taking our derivative here. So I want you to pause the video again and take the derivative of this equation with respect to x.
The derivative of ln y is y prime over y. This multiple of a 4 carries. The derivative of ln x to the third plus 1 is the derivative of the inside function, so that's 3x squared, over the inside function x to the third plus 1. Here the factor of 2 carries. We want the derivative of sine x in the numerator, that's cosine x, over that function sine x. And here the derivative of ln x is just 1 over x, and that 1 third carries as well. So now we're here. We can replace the cosine x over sine x by a cotan x. And now we're not quite finished because we want to solve for y prime. And on the left side we have y prime over y. So we need to multiply both sides by y, but of course we want to answer in terms of x only. So this y then gets replaced by the original function in terms of x. And this is our solution for y prime. And with this, we'll conclude our lesson on the natural log function.